go for it. Well, everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, I'm delighted to welcome one of history's, I guess you could say, most respected authors and most in incredible authors. Oh, I'm looking for a word here, but I'm forgetting it. I'll come back to me in a moment, but his name is Robert Green. Influential. There it is. <laughs> it came back to me. Told you. He is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The 48 Laws of Power, The Art of Seduction, The 33 Strategies of War, and The 50th Law, and of course, Mastery. In his highly anticipated sixth book, The Laws of Human Nature, he turns to the most important subject of all, understanding people's drives and motivations, even when they are unconscious of them themselves. I feel like that is something for me <laughs> very, very much. Um, you've done so many amazing things. You're very highly influential as well. I could go on and on and on, but Mr. Robert Green, welcome so much to Storybox podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. The pleasure is all mine. Let's unbox your story today. I can't okay. wait. Um, okay. Before we dive into it, though, I normally have one particular question that I love asking all my guests at the very, yeah. very start. I read out your, your bio um, just then. And what does success look like to you? Well, it's freedom. I mean, essentially, um, it's not so much the money. It's the fact that I can call my own shots. So I now have the respect. So if I want to write a book, which I'm currently in the process of doing, I can choose my, the subject that I want. The editors and the publishers pretty much leave me alone. I have carte blanche. And so, you know, and, and I'm not working really for anyone. I'm my own boss. I make up my own schedule, et cetera. So success means complete freedom for me. And believe me, I know what the opposite of that means because I didn't really have any success until I was about 36, 37 years old, maybe even a little older, because that's when I started writing the book. And prior to that, I had worked in offices, the worst jobs. I mean, my, my girlfriend and now my wife, we counted there were like 60 different jobs. Some of them were just so boring, so tedious, so demeaning. I know what a lot of people have to put up with in that kind of environment. I have a tremendous empathy for it. The political games, all the, the nasty stuff, how, how abusive bosses, et cetera. And the contrast between what I had prior to my success and what I have now is very striking. So I'd have to say, just to sum it up, that it's the freedom to call my own shots. Have you found it difficult over the years to create your own freedom in, in your current life right now? Well, you mean since I wrote the 48 Laws, I've had success? Yeah, since since you wrote the 48 Laws, the very first book, what was it like? You mentioned that you had so many different jobs there um, throughout up until the age of 30, I reckon. Was it difficult going from that to writing the 48 Laws to creating success? Was it difficult to create this freedom in life? Were you scared at all? Well, I wasn't scared. Yeah, I mean, I, there was the fact that I was desperate, let's put it that way, because I'm ambitious. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make it as a writer. I felt I had the skills and the talent to make it, but I had a lot of disappointment and I was quite depressed, to be honest with you. Prior to that, and I was living in a crappy one bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. And so, when I was given the chance to write the 38, 48 Laws of Power, I was desperate. You know, to me, it's like what 50 says, get rich or die trying. It was write a great book or die trying for me. So, you know, I had a tremendous surge of energy because I felt like this was my one chance to make it. It seemed like a really great fit. So I was going to put every ounce of my energy into that. Mm -hmm. And you know, you never know because the book if you is is a weird book. I mean, it looks strange. You've never seen a book on the inside that looks like the 48 Laws of Power, the design, the stories on the side, the way it's structured. So it was a tremendous risk. It could have failed miserably, and I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. Mm -hmm. So it took a great risk in writing the book the way I did. So if I had wanted to start out to write a book that would make a lot of money, and guarantee 
success. It would have been much different from that. But I understood intuitively one of the laws of power, which is to stand out from the crowd, to make yourself different, to not follow the formulas that other people follow. So by kind of living by some of my own laws, I think I've stumbled into something that was very successful. Mm. So I was so motivated that it wasn't difficult. I just had a lot of drive to get out of the rut that I was in. Mm. Why did you want to become a writer in the first place? What was it about writing that attracted you to it so much? Well, there's a man named, excuse me, I'm having my chocolate. Um, there's a man named Howard Gardner who wrote a really good book that I used for mastery called, I think it's the five frames of intelligence. I highly recommend it. It kind of maps out five different kinds of intelligence that people can have depending on how their brains are wired. So for some people it's patterns and kind of abstract thinking that leads them into math or the sciences for others. It's words and language, which will lead them into something related to writing. For others, it's images, visual things in the arts or in film. For others, it's kinetic movement and sports. And for others, it's something social. And he maintains that everybody has one intelligent form of intelligence that's dominant over the others. You can have maybe two, but usually there's one that dominates. And for me, sorry, since I was a kid, it was words. I just had an insane love for words. Mm. Um, and I love the process of writing. I mean, I read a lot. I love literature mm. and just words themselves entrance me. I, I can recall when I was eight or nine years old that a teacher was sort of talking to the class about how you could take a word and create other words from the letters inside of it. And who was the student who could create the most words from that? one large word, it was me because I was, wow, this is insane. How, how incredible. I just love language itself, the sound of words. So obviously I'm not good at a lot of things. Like my father was really good with his hands. He could build anything. He had been a mechanic in the Navy. Um, I'm terrible with my hands. I couldn't build anything. I, I wanted to play basketball, but I'm not good at it. I'm not a good dancer. I can't sing. I could go on and on and on about the 8,000 things I cannot do. But I knew since I was very young that I had one gift and that was for writing. Mm -hmm. So, and I tell people in mastery that that's the whole trick to, to the game of life is finding that one thing that you love that you're good at. It's not to say that writing doesn't have a lot of boring moments, a lot of incredible tedium and frustration. But because I love the process and the thrill of writing something that kind of engages all parts of my, my character, I can put up with the tedium and the boredom. Mm -hmm. But I just have this deep kind of primitive connection to just words and language itself. So that's why writing was the, was the main thing for me. I can relate to that on many, many levels because as a young kid, my, I grew up with reading because we didn't, we didn't have a TV. For a long time so, really really yeah so i'm only 24 so that's not that long ago <laughs> i know how, I come look never, how come you never tv well my parents they you have hippie, one... hippie parents <laughs> no yeah. not at all i had very conservative parents so they wow. sheltered us a lot from uh movies and tv shows and all that sort of stuff oh but that's good also the affordability of of having a tv was quite expensive back then so we we would rather get immersed in books and my parents would be yeah. like go outside and and enjoy the fresh air and i love that like i love doing that and i found this incredible um love for stories through yeah. some of the best stories ever written like you know i can rattle off some examples for me but one of the books that my mum read to me growing up was to, towards character character development and like those kinds of stories, they shaped my being. And that's one of the reasons why I fell in love with it. And to this day, Robert, I actually completed my first ever book, even though I suck at grammar, I suck at the actual 
getting what's in my head on paper because <laughs> it is incredibly tough. But going back to your story for a moment, why didn't you go on that path earlier on and write the 48 laws of power to start off with? Why did you wait until you're 30? Well, first thing, congratulations on your first book. That's, that's a great achievement. Thank you. You're going to have that for the rest of your life. And I always encourage people if they're so inclined to, to follow that path. Mm -hmm. Actually, I didn't have start the 48 Laws of Power until I was really about 37. Wow. Older than that. Um, the thing was, I started off, I thought maybe I would be a novelist. You know, I was kind of a romantic, dreaming kid in, when I was in college. But then I realized I had to make a living. You know, I, I, I don't come from poverty, but my parents are were solidly middle class so I couldn't they couldn't support me so I had to make a living so I chose journalism when I was young and I went to work in magazines in New York and it was it was good it taught me a lot but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do so then I'm thinking well I still want to write but journalism isn't the right thing what do I do so I went to Europe because I love languages I love the culture and I spent four or five years wandering around Europe doing all kinds of different jobs. I worked in a hotel in Paris as a receptionist. I taught English at a school in Barcelona. I worked in construction on an island on Crete, an island of Greece. I worked for a TV production company in London, on and on and on. And I tried to write novels because that was my dream. And I wasn't good at it or I didn't have the discipline. So now I'm like, God, I can't make a living like this. What am I going to do? So I came back to Los Angeles, where I'm from, Hollywood, and I decided I'm going to try screenwriting and try the film business. So I kept at it. I kept at it. I kept at it. And now I'm about 30 and I'm working in Hollywood and I'm trying to write screenplays and I'm trying to fit in. And it doesn't fit me because I told you I love freedom. I love power, as, as everybody would guess. And in Hollywood, you don't have any freedom. You don't have any power. You're one writer and there's 12 other writers coming on board. There's the producer, there's the director. You have no control. It wasn't a good fit. So, you know, I couldn't find the right thing. And then I met a man in Italy when I had another, yet another job, who was a book packager. And he basically saved my life. His name is Joost Elfers. He asked me one day when we were in Venice, Italy, if I had an idea for a book or any ideas. And I kind of improvised what turned into the 48 Laws of Power. So um, it wasn't that I, if I had been offered, if I had met this man when I was 22 or 23, to answer your question, and I could have written the book then, which would have never came to me when I was that young, mm. I wouldn't have been able to write it because I didn't have the discipline. I didn't have the skill that, taught, that I learned in journalism, that I learned in Hollywood. I didn't have the world experiences. A lot of my own personal experiences bad experiences in the work world went into the 48 laws of power. A lot of my understanding of human psychology, and particularly of the dark side of human psychology, came from the fact that I had all of this experience. So it just happened to the gods or fate happened to will it that by the time I was 36, 37, I was prepared to write this book. Mm -hmm. And I tell people there's a lesson there. It's not just me spouting off my story. And the lesson is, if you are young, your 20s, which for me were those basically those years of wandering, are absolutely critical. And what you need to do is you need to pursue something that you love, try different things. And at some point when you're in your 30s, hope maybe your early 30s, younger than me, an opportunity will come your way to kind of combine what you all the things you've learned in your life into one business or one book or one film, or whatever it is, because you've developed all these, patiently developed these skills. So that was sort of the path that I took. But it all kind of worked out in the end. I don't think I would have been able to write the book when I was younger. Mm. I can also relate to that because I had so many different jobs growing up. Um, and they all taught me. You're only 24. I'm only 24. Believe it or not, Robert, my story is wild as heck. <laughs> oh, wow. so it, Good for you. I know because I, I don't, um, 
I don't have like this sense of, oh, woe is me. You know, I went through all that, blah, blah, blah. I have this incredible sense of, yes, I went through all that. It taught me X, Y, and Z, and I am who I am today because of it. So it's an amazing thing. I think experience is the best teacher. Uh, yep. no, no doubt. Um, and I'm curious for you, Robert, like you've, you've written these incredible books. You've, what is your creative process like as you were writing these books? Like, do you, do you, you go out in nature at all? Like what goes through your mind? Well, um, Otto von Bismarck, the 19th century German Prussian politician, he once said, you should never know how a sausage is being made. Uh, if you did, you would never want to eat one, <laughs> right? And the idea is if you ever knew exactly how I write a book, you would never read one of my books. Um, the process is actually not so sexy. Essentially, I do tons of research, right? Um, I read hundreds and hundreds of books to write one book. And then I compile it all with note. I have a note card system which I've kind of documented on, in social media before. And I have pictures of the thousand over. So my new book, I have about 12, 1300 note cards that I've already done different colors, which I put into chapter headings and the research kind of tells me what the book should be and what the chapter should be. So I do a lot of research and structuring before I start writing. And then when I have writing, I use my cards. And I kind of riff on them like, like a musician. I have the basic melody down, what I want for my song, but I kind of improvise. I go where the spirit leads me. And so I keep things, it's like a dance between you want things kind of channeled and disciplined. Like you just don't want to start writing and, and just improvise completely. But if your, your structure and your ideas are so tight, you've already figured out everything you want to write, there's no fun involved. There's no impulse, there's no creativity. And the writing will show, the writing will be very dry and lifeless. And I want my writing to always be in the moment to have a spirit to it. So I have a structure, I have the basic ideas down, and then I start writing. And it's not like I'm like wildly inspired and I'm going crazy and I'm having so much fun and I'm high. It's usually never like that. But there are moments where I get inspired and things start really go clicking. And then usually as I edit what I write, it starts getting, that's where I really have more fun because then I start really improving things. My, my first drafts aren't very good. You know, I used to, to go, as you, to answer your question, I used to take long hikes in my neighborhood because we have some beautiful park nearby and I would get 90% of my best ideas in hiking. I also would take a, 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 my mountain bike up into the hills or I'd go swimming. But I had a stroke a couple of years ago and I can't take a hike and I can't do those things. So it's been very difficult on my new book to find those outlets. So I have to kind of figure something else out, which I've managed to do. But the lesson is I have to feel in a mood. I have to be excited by what I'm writing. I don't want the writing to start getting dull. I don't want me to start feeling bored or, 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 or put off by the work because it'll show in the work. So I'm constantly finding ways to drum up the energy and excite me. And that could be listening to some music or that could be reading passages from some of my favorite writers. So I have to keep a level of excitement and enthusiasm. Otherwise, I think the readers feel that, that I don't have that. Oh, you mentioned earlier before we even started this that you did have a stroke and then I wanted to bring it towards you actually having that yeah. stroke in the first place what was it like what was going through your brain the moment you did have that stroke well not much because um i was in the car i was driving my girlfriend now wife she was in the passenger seat and basically she said um, she saw something was wrong with me my whole face was weird i didn't really feel anything she said pull over pull over I go, why and then, then I went. Out and then I was unconscious, and I went into a coma. And I don't really remember what happened. She called the um, the nine one one, the ambulance, right away. And they were luckily fairly close. And the hospital where I have insurance was fairly close. And they operated on me very quickly. I said I was unconscious for a couple hours, and um, and 
and uh, you know, so I came very, very close to dying or to having complete uh, brain damage. But thanks that I wasn't alone, that she was there, that she called quickly, and they responded. I had obviously damage to the left, to the right side of my brain, but nothing so severe that I lost my ability to think or to talk. But it was a very, very awful recovery process. I was in the hospital for a week. Then I was in the bed in my house for several weeks. And then I had to basically retrain myself to be able to walk. And I still can't walk, like just go up the hill and take a hike. I can walk fairly well on level ground, but I, I use a cane. I was supposed to have a full recovery, but to be honest with you, it's still several years away before I can resume some of those things that I love. I've got a special bicycle so that I can still ride up a recumbent bike basically like a, a tricked up tricycle for adults. Mm. Um, and so I get, I get some of my yayas out that way, but basically I've had to redo my whole personality, my whole way of, of, of finding ways to relieve my stress. Mm. And it's not been easy, but you know, I, I'm doing the best that I can. What did that whole experience teach you about power? And having that kind of power sort of stripped away from you in that moment. Well, it taught me that it can happen to anyone at any second now, you know, because it, it's not like I had a sudden decline in my health, which gives you time to kind of get used to the idea, which is awful in itself, but it's, it's a different process. For me, it's like one day you're swimming, you're hiking the next day. You can't do any of that. So I had to really, you know, make a, a major adjustment. And it's shown, taught me that I have certain flaws and certain weaknesses in my character, which are that I'm impatient, that I don't like. I, I was kind of spoiled. I had this good life. I could do whatever I wanted. I kind of took it for granted. And now when I think back, I go, God, why? I should have appreciated all the things that I could do that I can't do now. So um, I've sort of learned a lot about my own weaknesses and my own flaws. I would get very frustrated. Like, you know, you can't use your left hand and your left arm so well. And just sometimes I just want to like scream that I can't just like do basic things like tying your shoelaces easily, which I can kind of do now. But And I've had to sort of find ways to deal with my frustration. I do a lot of meditation. I try to continually calm myself down because people that have strokes, when they're not, when they're fairly young, I'm fairly young. I mean, I'm not young, but I'm relatively young. Um, it, you get, people can become very depressed because you lose the power to do basic things. So you have to continually struggle against that and find ways to relieve that stress and relieve, you know, my frustration and depression. And of course, having COVID and everything, this comes on top of all of that. So um, it's it's tough, but you know, but for people out there, it can happen any moment to anybody. You can have. I read recently about a woman who was a a writer in the university and everything. She loved riding her bikes, her bike, and then she had an accident and was basically paralyzed. So it's a similar thing. And I see stories like that. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to you even when you're 24. So it really, the lesson is to just kind of really, really appreciate that you have a body, that, that you have energy, that you can do certain basic things. Don't take it for granted. It's kind of, you know, if I could go back three years, that's what I would be telling myself. Mm. Being in a, a place of sheer gratitude, I think. And I wanted to ask about, like speaking more, into this this conversation of power and why do you think we as human beings we crave this kind of power in the first place and who craves it more is it more the males or the females well i try to make it the point in my books that everybody craves power even little children um maybe by the time you're in your 90s or 80s it kind of mellows a little bit but the idea that you have no control over your destiny, over your environment, over your atmosphere, that you can't control your kids. They just do whatever. They don't listen to you. 
that you can't control your spouse or your your significant other, that you can't have any influence over your colleagues or your boss. You can't choose the career that you want, that you're basically a slave to, to, to a, 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 a bad wage or whatever. That is powerlessness, and that equals sheer misery. So a lot of people associate the word with power with great politicians and presidents and all their kind of games that they're playing, like the House of Cards or something. But I don't think of power that way. I see it as in daily, your daily life. You want a degree of control over your environment, over the people around you, over yourself. You know, so we live in a very chaotic, competitive world, and it's gotten worse and worse. And there's nobody out there who really has your back like you did maybe 50 years ago, right? You're kind of out there for yourself. So you, there's a lot of insecurity in the world today, particularly with your careers. Definitely with like things like a pandemic, who could predict that? So we don't like, we humans, and I talk about this in human nature, we don't like unpredictability. We don't like that feeling that we're completely uh, vulnerable to whatever happens in the world, that we have no degree of control. And of course, there's a lot of things you cannot control, right? I can't, can't control having a stroke. You can't control being suddenly laid off. There's much that you can't. But the sense that you have some power, that you can influence people, that you can get them interested in your ideas, that your children will listen to you. I don't think anybody doesn't want that. And there's the myth that it's only that men want power. I think it's been ex completely exploded in the last 10 years or less with the whole Me Too movement and everything. I mean, women are very frustrated about the power inequalities and they want power. They want the same rights, the same privileges, the same opportunities as men. Mm -hmm. So it's a myth to think that only men are after power and ambitious. That's to go back to that cliche of the house of cards or, or some political figure. That's not what real power is like. So I think everybody on the planet, human, talking about humans, but even animals, would, I would argue, uh, have this desire. They have a will to power, a will to expand and have some degree of control over their life and their environment. Have you looked at or dived into the reasons for why people crave that sense of power in the first place? And then when it is taken away from them, why do they want to crave it even more? Why do they want to get it back? Well, um, I mean, it's kind of wired into our nature. Um, essentially um, human beings we're we're sort of weak creatures compared to other animals. And this, this goes back hundreds of thousands of years. We don't have the forms of defense that other animals have. We don't have poison. We don't have large claws. We can't run that fast. We're very weak and vulnerable. And so it's built into our system, the sense of insecurity and vulnerability. And it, we, we gain a degree of control through becoming a, a supreme social animal, right? But um, so the idea that, you know, you, you can't control anything around you um, is triggers some of the worst kind of emotions in us going back, as I said, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And so, um, you know, once you've tasted in your life, like this is sort of what I try and tell people in the in like in the 48 laws, for instance. So there's a, a law that is very basic called always say less than necessary, right? And the idea is talking too much is, is a problem, isn't very powerful because you can probably say something stupid. You're gonna you're gonna reveal that you have no self-control, that people respect and admire those who kind of speak less and kind of seem mysterious. Mm. You enact that law going forward just in a couple of days and you sense, wow, people respond to me differently. That's interesting. There's some power in there. And once you taste that, you realize the difference between what you were before when you just said whatever came to your mind and the sense of empowerment where you can, you can begin to control yourself and you can begin to control how others see you. And there's no going back once you get that. You understand 
that you have possibilities for expanding your sense of power and control. And going and taking some of those steps is incredibly addicting. So, um, and then to suddenly lose your freedom, to lose all of that, let's say you, like for me, for instance, I, I, my writing career would be over or whatever. The contrast would be absolutely devastating, you know? So I, I have a lot of empathy for people who are in that situation who might have lost their job because of the pandemic, et cetera. And the thing is, my concept of power is it kind of begins with yourself. If you can't control yourself and your own emotions and your own thinking patterns, you're not going to have any influence over the world around you, over the people around you, right? So you have to have a degree of self-awareness of who you are, of your own flaws, and of you can, you can control yourself to some degree. You can kind of alter some of your worst behavior patterns. That's what true power is. And that really can't be taken away from you. Once you kind of acquire that, that awareness and that ability to, to kind of work on yourself, nobody can really take that away from you. It will serve you in any kind of circumstance that might happen. Mm. Speaking about or more, more about power and leadership and vulnerability is are the same thing. My, my question to you would be, I'm, I'm very fascinated by this because all leaders have some sense of, of confidence and power and, 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 and that sort of thing. But when it comes to fear factor or fearing the unknown, fearing what's not there, how can we, I guess my question would be is how can we become better leaders in the state of the unknown? Well, um, it's, it's kind of, um, so the world is, is incredibly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Everything around us is, you never know what tomorrow will bring, right? And so what distinguishes somebody who's truly powerful, particularly in a leadership position, is their ability to adapt to what the circumstances bring. It doesn't mean that you don't have principles doesn't mean that you don't have ideas that are important and values that are important to you, but you're able to adapt to what happens in the moment. You don't hold on to ideas and strategies that you used two years ago that are no longer relevant. I, in my book, The 33 Strategies of War, I talk a lot about that. I call it, do not fight the last war. It's idea based on Sun Tzu. I also talk about it in the 48 Laws in Assume Formlessness. You want a mind that's fluid. You want to be able to adapt to what's happening. So if something uncertain or something you couldn't predict happens, you don't get all rigid and fearful and hold on to or, or get whiny and complain about them. You go, okay, the worst that can happen, anything bad often contains possibilities and opportunities for me. It's all in your attitude, how you look at any kind of change in your circumstances. So a powerful person or a leader, when something awful happens, like some something bad happens to their business or whatever, they look at it, the bad leader gets all complaining and defensive and points fingers. The smart leader says, there's an opportunity in this. There's something good that can happen from it. It all depends on how I look at it. In the 50th law, the 50 calls the turning shit into sugar. Mm -hmm. So anything bad, that happens contains possibilities for change. And so I talked in one of the podcasts, that, in one of the um, videos that I did about COVID. And, you know, that uh, on the surface, it looks like the worst thing that can happen to someone. You know, you're stuck at home. Now you can't really socialize and do things. I mean, I don't know what it's like in Australia. But it's really, really bad in California right now. Um, your career might be at, at, at stake. You might not have a career. You might not have a business to go back to when this is all over. And you have to look at this in the, in, in the following way, that this is a chance for you to like reconstruct yourself, recreate yourself and step back first and evaluate. Was I on the right career path? Was this something that I really, really loved? Is this the right thing for me? Take this time to be kind of self-aware and to maybe write in a journal and think about who you are and what you want and what your goal, real goals are in life. 
It's a time to be introspective, to start reading a lot of books, to improve your mind. It's time to like develop new skills that you can get on the internet or you can pick up and, and learn something new. You've got more time on your hand. You can be at home. So this is a time where you can take the worst possible circumstance and transform it into something very positive. You adapt to whatever life gives you. And that's the, that's the powerful way of being. Mm. I think you raised a very, very good point there. One question that I did have out of all that is I think you, you're mentioning that this is all, this all can be taught. So if I was to take, for example, myself in this instance, that wants to become a good leader, that wants to become someone that I guess adapts to everything that goes wrong, in, in terms of the challenges and, and the situations, for example, COVID, what are some some of the ways? Because I know it's not easy. It's easier said than done, right? So for those people that want to know, I guess, simple strategies and applications to, to practice in their own life right now, what would you say to them? Strategies for what? No, I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow that strategies to i guess become more adaptable to the current situation like like I, like I was talking about it's not essentially easy in a bad situation to accept what is happening i guess we can all go in the the reverse and we can all feel stressed and anxious and all these kind of emotions can form within us but how can we i guess not do we subdue them or do we just, what, what do we do? Well, you have to develop habits. Uh, you have to develop day by day, certain habits of thinking and certain habits of reacting. So the idea of how can I change myself? What's the strategy I need to change myself already reveals a level of impatience and it's already kind of dooming yourself. You need to realize it's going to be a day-by-day -day process that's starting tomorrow. You're going to take small steps to change some of the negative habits that you might have in your life. So um, you have to kind of alter how you think about things, and you have to slow yourself down and not react and get emotional with things that happen in the moment. Now, of course, as you point out, that's easier said than done. Okay, so you have to take small steps. So you, you monitor yourself. And I've talked about this a lot in other podcasts. You look at yourself and you don't just simply feel anger, frustration, depression, or boredom. You step back and you go, why am I feeling this way today? Why am I so bored or why am I so depressed? And you don't just simply react on that and grab a bottle of beer or, or turn on a video game. You analyze yourself. You think about what might be the source of it. Mm. And as you do that, you begin to realize, well, maybe my emotion isn't very real. Maybe it's based on something I read on social media. Maybe it's based on certain bad habits that I have. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to think a little bit differently about that. Maybe I'm not really depressed or maybe there's something else going on behind that. And as that happens, you develop slowly the ability to look at yourself and instead of just getting angry and reacting you're able to step back and say what's really going on here and that kind of thing isn't going to happen tomorrow if you could just do that once tomorrow for a couple of minutes you will see that's very interesting mm. this is i've never really thought of myself in this way i've never really taken the time to analyze my own feelings and my, I usually just react. This is different. Mm -hmm. And sensing for that one moment that there's something different about that, you go, wow. And you, you're going to want to try it more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a day by day process. And you have to, you have to have this attitude towards life, which is, and as you say, as you point out, it's not easy. So you have to develop it. But what it all comes down to is, is, is very simple. Do you want power? Do you really want power in your life? Do you really want a degree of control over events? Do you want some success? Do you want to feel fulfilled? Or do you just want to complain and wallow in your own grievances and your own misery? 
If it's the first one, then you really are motivated to change some of these negative habits that you might have, right? But um, so sensing some of the power that you can have by altering some of these habits. The other thing is you accept the fact that life is unpredictable there's un and there's uncertainty involved. And it's all about a little shift that goes on in your brain. If you find chaos or uncertainty, you know, something that, that repels you that you can't stand, then you're going to be in trouble because that means you're, you're, going to, you're never going to be able to adapt. You have to change. Look, something has to click in your brain where you go, I love uncertainty. I love the unpredictable. Chaos is fine. I'm going to make it work. I'm not going to be rigid. I'm going to be fluid. I'm going to make myself adapt. You repeat that day after day after day after day. You say, whatever comes my way, whatever circumstance there is, I'm going to find a way to make it a moment of power. I'm going to find a way to turn it to my advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have to do these little mental games and you have to work on it every single day. It's not going to suddenly transform you in a week or, or even two weeks or a month. Mm. So anyone can become a master of this. Well, you know, we all have levels of fear and some people have very high levels of fear and it's, it's something that their brains might be wired that way. And it's much more difficult, right? It's much more difficult to accept unpredictability and uncertainty if you have high levels of fear. And I talk a lot about that in the 50th law of the book I did with 50 Cent, which is all about how to overcome your fears. And that once again, it's like a day, a day by day process. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if you, if you fear like heights and you have vertigo, like I've had before or, or claustrophobia, you have to expose yourself to the situation that you're afraid of to realize that there's nothing really to be afraid of. And once you do that, you start, you know, you realize, hmm, maybe being in a crowded elevator, I don't need to hyperventilate. I'm okay like that, right? Mm -hmm. So it all depends on what you bring to the table. If you're somebody already riddled with a lot of anxiety, what I'm talking about is a lot harder, but it's not impossible. You know, everybody is difficult. I'm not saying everybody can completely master themselves, but a sense, the other thing that's really important to overcome anxiety that a lot of people might have is to immerse yourself in some in making something, in doing something. Mm -hmm. If you spend the whole time now that you're confined, thinking about yourself and worried and anxious, you're going to kind of grind yourself down and you're going to make yourself more miserable. But if you can put your energy into a project, into writing a book, into starting that business idea that you had, into going back into school and learning the skill, you get outside of your mind and you can calm down some of your anxieties and, folk, and put the focus on creating something. That's a very calming effect. These are all kinds of things that are very important to develop during this time. Who in history for you, Robert, that stood out to you the most that kind of inspired you, I guess, around mastery? Who general, uh, someone that you, someone that you looked at that kind of gave you a new perspective on this? Well, you know, when I wrote the, um, the 33 Strategies of War, the main character was Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm. He was one of the inspirations because basically he's considered the first 10 years of his career as a general as the most brilliant strategist that ever lived. Mm. The series of victories is, is, is uncanny. It was unbelievable. And, you know, where did it come from? Was there some sort of special thing that he had in his brain that, you know, was he wired that way? Was he just born a genius in warfare? Well, I don't believe that. I don't believe anybody is born a genius. It's something that you develop. And I learned in studying Napoleon in great depth. I read a dozen books about him, some of them like 1,200 pages long. I delved very deeply into his psychology, into his makeup. And really what made him a master, at least for those 10 years, was the fact that he was so brilliant at details and organization. So he had learned, he, he, he rose up from the bottom, right? Because he came from 
wasn't poor, but he rose up from course that he had to fight his way to the top. So he learned all aspects of military. He was he was an artillery person early on, and then he learned other skills, etc. So he had a mastery of all of the details of warfare. And then when it came for a campaign, he read every single possibility about that particular campaign. What was the terrain like? What was every square foot of that terrain going to be like? What could he use? What was the general who's opposing me? What's his psychology? What's the morale of his troops? How many cavalry does he have? He knew 20 times more than the opposing general about the details of the battle, right? And then he took all of this information and he organized it in his head and he, he wrote it out on, on note cards, et cetera. And he would sit on the floor with a giant map of, of, the, of, the, of the field of, of battle. And he would think very deeply about all the possibilities that he could do to making a successful campaign. When you put together someone with insane attention to detail, with an incredible ability to organize, he's now going to be when the battle comes and he's there on his horse. He's not at, he's, he's, he was sort of sometimes at the front lines, but he also wasn't necessarily there. He was calm. He knew that he had a, a perfect plan. And if things changed, he never, he never made a plan that was rigid, like we're going to go attack this way. He created a, a, a plan with like three branches. I could go this way, I could go that way, I could go that way. So he had this sense of calmness. I can take whatever the enemy gives me and I will surmount it because I have a great plan. I have a great s system here and I can be creative in the moment. You had all of that together and you're going to be an incredible genius. You are going to be brilliant at warfare, right? And that was the model. Now, it kind of fell apart for Napoleon. The last 10 years was a lot of disaster. And it's interesting to show how he started to become rigid and conservative, and he kind of lost all the brilliant things I've just told you about. But that served to me, that came to me as a model. And when I looked at Leonardo da Vinci, who was another master that really inspired me, it's the same thing. An insane knowledge of the details of anatomy of science, of what makes a living thing alive in order to paint it. It's the same thing with a great composer like a Mozart. It was the same thing with Albert Einstein. That is the model, that is the pattern. When you accumulate vast amounts of knowledge and information more than anybody else, and you're able to organize it in some way in your head, and then when when ideas, ideas will come to you out of nowhere, and you're going to have a level of thinking creativity that far surpasses others. So I would say Napoleon was sort of one of the sources that kind of helped me understand the pattern that I talked about in mastery. I think he is a, a great example with Napoleon. Um, I think all great people in history had some level of eccentric. Uh, they were highly, I think you, you just said it, highly detailed, highly efficient, or I would say we're all weird in some capacity, which is a yeah. great thing. It makes us human, but some were even more so. And they right. took, took it to the extreme, which I think illustrates the point of being a master in their own way. Um, and now we look at their life and we learn from their, their, yeah, their life really. I think for me, when I'm, when I'm, like my, my mind is going all over the place right now, Robert, just so you can, because I've got so many questions all roaming around in my brain and I'm trying to figure out which one should I ask right now? Cause there's so many. Um, but one, two final questions, cause I know our time is, is running towards the end, but speaking towards seduction for a moment, this is very interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, this, <laughs> so when we're talking about people who are able to seduce another human being, does that come with once again, the kind of innate being that we are, or is that something once again, like you look at Cleopatra, for example, she was a natural seduction seductress, I guess you could say with, with men. Um, and then you look at people in history, like, 
males that were great at seduction and got people to do their own their own will how can we become better at seducing and is seducing the right thing to do in life <laughs> if that makes any sense at all well it's the right thing to do if if you are so inclined if you if you're feeling like um you know you're you're really awkward around let's say i'm talking from a male perspective you're really awkward around women you want to meet women you want to date them you're young you have a lot of sexual energy you're excited but you're awkward you can't get something about you is turning them off you're not you, you know you're something is not your approach is not right and so yeah seduction would be very helpful it would it would help you psychologically it would help you deal with your insecurities it would make you feel more powerful in this one aspect of life which might translate seduction is not just a sexual thing it's also a social thing mm. so if i learn how to entice another a woman and get her interested in me i can apply that in the office i can get other colleagues not in a sexual sense but for work interested in my ideas and it builds confidence and you feel great right so it can spill over so for someone like that yeah it's extremely important if you're married and you've been married for 30 or 40 years and then maybe seduction isn't such an important thing for you in your particular moment it depends on where you're at but you know i don't believe anybody is born naturally at with a high level of skill in anything now of course some people have a leg up a little bit on when it comes to seduction in one sense in that they're able to observe people on a higher level so the main impediment to seducing a man or a woman or or whatever you want to seduce i guess that covers everything a man or a woman i don't know what else an alien um you know <laughs> or your cat or your dog mm. is to be able to get outside of yourself and to get inside their spirit and to imagine what their world is like what their fantasies are like what are they thinking what is that one gift that i can give them that that will really surprise them it's to individualize your attention the worst seducers are those who kind of learn some strategies from a book and apply it to any anybody out there so the woman in this case because i'm just speaking from a male perspective doesn't feel like your attention is personal it's not individualized it's like she might as well be anybody you know and so that's very off putting so the idea that you can individ personalize your attention get inside the skin of other people some people are better at that early on in life for whatever reason and some people find it hard i don't doubt that but anybody can begin to develop that skill it's not it's not like you know it's impossible and there're plenty of examples of in my book of men and women who weren't really very good at that in the beginning and they learned through a process that they had to overcome this impediment now this was into sexual seduction but i talk in mastery about the american political figure benjamin franklin mm -hmm. who ended up becoming a master social seducer he was an anasexual seducer women were dropping like you know like leaves in front of him when he went to anywhere he was and he wasn't very handsome either but he realized that he early on when he was young that he had no power he was not good at seduction he was terrible at it he talked too much he was so pompous and full of himself that it put everybody off and he trained himself slowly to stop all of that and to think very deeply about the other person to get into their spirit to get into their insecurities to get into what would make them suddenly open their eyes and go hmm yeah i wanted I want to do something with Benjamin. He's a great person to work with. Mm. That is a power that anybody can develop. It's like it would be like I'm saying to you, you could never learn the piano for whatever reason. Why? Well, if starting tomorrow you open the keys and you uh, you got a piano, you started practicing, you would be pretty bad. But if you kept at it for a year, you'd be pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. A couple of years, you'd be very good. It's the same thing if you if you practice something, if you're want willing and you're motivated to learn how to get outside of yourself because that's that's the main anti-seductive quality that people have so if you're in a situation once again from that male perspective so women out there please excuse me but that's the only perspective that I have right now 
And you're in a situation with a woman and you're trying to maybe take the seduction to the next level. And you're sitting there thinking about your insecurities, thinking about, does she really like me? Mm. Am I doing the right thing? Right? The woman senses that she picks up the vibes non-verbally that you are insecure, that you're thinking about yourself and it breaks the spell, right? It breaks the spell and nothing will really happen. So the ability to stop that, to do the opposite in the moment, to not feel any insecurity, to feel confident, to go, all right, she might reject me. She rejects me. I don't care. I want to try to understand what her world is like. And, you know, and, and then I'm gonna, if, if it doesn't work, I'm going to try it with the next woman, et cetera. But getting outside of yourself is not only the most important seductive tactic, it's, it's therapy because we're all too self-absorbed. So generally being able to feel what other people might be feeling. And it's not just, I can't under, know what she might be thinking. I'm not a mind reader, but I can understand what she's feeling. I can get her, 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 her vibe, the vibe she's giving off. I can look at her body language. I can see her nonverbal behavior. You can understand what people are feeling. To do that is immensely powerful and immensely seductive. Mm. And I maintain anybody can begin to learn that. Mm. And seduction is also a, a kind of a sense of power as well, being able to convince or get people to do things that you necessarily want them to do. So that kind of boosts your, your perception of, okay, I am powerful, I am strong, I, am, I got this person to do something. So, I mean, let's let's say you had a, a project that you wanted to get funded, like a film project or something, mm. um, and you go at it thinking, "Oh, my idea is so good! It's such a brilliant script idea that they're going to love it." And you go into a meeting like that. That is very unseductive. That means you're self-absorbed. But if you start from the dip the opposite perspective, what is it about the other person that they want to see? What is their psychology? What do they need? What are their problems right now? How will this excite them knowing that they're different from me? That is a seductive approach. Mm -hmm. So if you learn this in dealing with a, a woman or a man, you can apply it to any situation, thinking of what they want, what they need, what their values are, what their needs are, is the first step towards any kind of form of persuasion. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, that's so good. <laughs> I, I always say that my dog, she doesn't have to say, she can't say anything, but she gives me the eyes. She gives me the the emotion, the energy that brings it off and gets me to do things that I don't want to do, <laughs> which is like give her food. <laughs> oh, 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 take her for a walk. Or take her for a walk, you know, all those. She, she, she's, a, she's a seductress. Ah. Oh, Mate, you don't, I have no idea. Like, <laughs> I can show you so many videos, like this one yeah. video that I posted real quick on, on TikTok and she has a spot on the couch. My dad took the spot and she sat on his lap until he moved to get her spot. <laughs> she, she put on the act, man, like it was unbelievable. <laughs> well, you don't, need, you don't need to read The Art of Seduction. You just need to, to follow your dog and, and learn, from, learn from her. Tell me about what it. Kind of, <laughs> what kind of dog is she? She's a German Shepherd, so I'll show you. Uh, this photo will now? say it all to you. Oh, yeah. What a sweetheart. What's her name? Alita Joy. Alita Joy. Wow. Yeah. Alita Joy. Yeah. Phantom. So we say that she has the ability to convince myself and my dad and my mom always says we're too soft. <laughs> <laughs> but can you blame us? <laughs> no, yeah. no. She, she's, uh, yeah. she's adorable. Um, my final question for you, Robert, this is my all-time favorite question that I love asking people at the end. So it's a hypothetical one. So I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your friends have decided to put together a highlight film or a film, whichever one you want, of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic. They've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Well, um, you know, as you get older, you you have all of these encounters that you had when you were younger. Some of them very powerful, some of them very emotional, and they kind of fade from you as you get older. You forget them, 
or these people have dropped out of your life. You can't even sometimes even remember their names, but something remains in your memory of some kind of powerful encounter. So I've had a lot of them in my life, um, you know, probably too many to, to begin to count. And to have all of those people come together from my past, recounting things that I may have forgotten about our encounters and the influence that I had on them for good or for bad, that would be immensely satisfying. And then to hear from readers of my books, whom I've never met before, sort of recount on video how my books helped them in some very important way and led to some great career break or how my books ruined their lives and then I, then make me miserable. Okay. But, you know, to hear, hear from all of my, you know, people who like my books and have that, those kinds of testimonies. And mostly though, to hear from friends, you know, by the time I'm a hundred, 95% of my friends will be dead anyway. You know, that's, that's the sad thing that happens as you get older. So if somehow they could be brought back to life, I recently lost one of my closest friends from junior high and high school, you know, and I'm not that old. He was, he was 61, 62, you know, and um, he had uh, a terrible form of cancer. And, you know, I, the thought that I'll never be able to talk to him again, it's very painful. So if I could somehow bring these people back to life and hear some kind of recording about our, our past together. That would be great, you know, because I'm, I'm a sentimental person. I get very attached to some of these moments in life. And the fact that as I get older, I'm very distanced from them is, is very painful. So if you could do that for me, I'd be extremely happy when I reach my 100th birthday. If you could do the research, if you could bring some of these people back from the dead and you could get their testimony and you could compile that, I will give you all the money that I possess in the world. I will do whatever you want. Okay. That would be sort of it, you know, to feel like I had an impact on their life for good or for bad. That would be sort of my fantasy. Well, let me just say, Robert, like I wouldn't even accept your money. I'd just do it out of sheer want <laughs> to help. All right. I'm going to take, I'm going to take you up on that. Yeah. <laughs> so if I, if I some by some miracle end up having that, that, that happen, I'll um, yeah. I'll definitely keep you in mind and and crazy. All right, all right, I'm I'm gonna hold you to that. <laughs> but Robert Green, thank you so much, sir, for for everything that you've done, everything that you put out there into the world. All oh, the, thank you so much. The, wisdom, the knowledge you are a master of his craft, no doubt. Yeah. Influential. Yeah. Um, thank yeah. you so much for coming on the Storybox podcast today. Yeah. And uh, thank you, and enjoy that beautiful Sydney weather. It looks like it's summer there. Is it summer there? It's summer here. Uh, it doesn't even actually yeah. feel like summer for some reason. Like it's kind of weird. We've had like winter in summer and then oh. winter was summer. <laughs> it's it's oh. strange. Sydney weather, man. It's weird. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know that. Well, anyway, don't take Sydney for granted no. and, and go out there and appreciate everything about that beautiful city and uh, look at it. Try and look at it from my point of view. Somebody who came from an in California and it's like entranced by the city. Try and see it in a new light because you're very lucky to live in such a beautiful place. <laughs>